Okay, this video is on the greatest integer function. And the greatest integer function is also sometimes called the step function. And we're going to see why in just a minute. It's also occasionally called the floor function. Although more often you hear it called greatest integer or step function. It's written like this with a kind of a bracket notation. f equals greatest integer of x. Sometimes you see it written with a kind of double bracket looking notation. But most of the time we're just going to use this single bracket notation. And what the greatest integer function does is it takes the input value, that is it takes the x value, and it finds the greatest integer closest to that number, closest to the x value, without going over. So let's take a few examples. Take a look at some examples here. Example number one, the greatest integer of 7.35. So we want to know the greatest integer closest to 7.35 that doesn't go over 7.35. Well, hopefully it's not too hard to see that the number 7 is the greatest integer that is not larger than 7.35. It's less than 7.35. The next closest integer would be 8, but I can see 8 is greater than 7.35. So our answer here is 7. The greatest integer of 4 thirds, typically it's easier to think about greatest integer functions with decimal numbers. So I'm just going to change this one from 4 thirds into 1.3, and it's actually 1.3333 or 1.3 with a bar over it. And again, I want to know, well, what's the largest integer closest to 1.333 that doesn't go over? And again, that number is going to be 1, because 1 doesn't go over 1.3. It's closest integer to 1.333. The next closest integer would be 2, but again, 2 is greater than 1.3, and I don't want to go over. So you might be thinking, well, this seems pretty simple. All we got to do is just kind of chop off the decimal part of whatever is inside the brackets, and we're done. Except, when you have to deal with negative numbers, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different. And now for this one, example number three, I want to know what is the greatest integer of negative 2.5. And I'm actually going to talk about this one in terms of a number line. So draw this number line here on your paper and put 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, all right? And now the number negative 2.5 would be approximately right here on your number line, right, in between negative 2 and negative 3. Well, if I want the greatest integer of negative 2.5, that means I want the integer that's closest to negative 2.5 without going over. And it might be tempting to say, well, that number's going to be negative 2, right? Because you just kind of cover up the decimal part. Except, notice that the number negative 2, while it is an integer, and while it is close to negative 2.5, negative 2 is over, that is, it's greater than negative 2.5. In other words, if I choose negative 2 for my greatest integer, I've gone over the value of negative 2.5. Negative 2 is greater than negative 2.5. That is, negative 2 is to the right of negative 2.5 on the number line. So it turns out that the integer that's closest to negative 2.5 without going over negative 2.5 is actually negative 3. Let's take a look at example number four, and again, I'm going to take a look at this one using a number line. So let's see, negative 17, so let's say I've got zero over here somewhere, and let's see, I've got, let's say, negative 15, negative 16, negative 17, negative 18, and negative 17.3 would be about right here. And again, I want to know what's the integer closest to this number right here, but that doesn't go over that number. And remember, over in terms of the number line means to the right of this number. Well, I can see negative 17. It's tempting to say that the greatest integer for negative 17.3 would be negative 17, 
but negative 17 is greater than negative 17.3. So my actual greatest integer without going over is negative 18. Negative 18 is the closest integer to this value without going over. All right, so let's take a look now at what the graph of the greatest integer function looks like. And here you're going to see where it got its nickname, the step function. So here is our function, y equals greatest integer of x. So I'm going to take some values here of x, and I'm going to plug them into my function. I'm going to come up with their corresponding y values, and then we're going to plot those values over here on our x, y axes. So let's see. Actually, I'm going to start with I'm going to start with 0 and the positive numbers because they're a lot easier to do, and then I'm going to go back to the negative numbers. So let's see. x equals 0. Greatest integer is just going to be 0. If x equals 0.25, that means I want the closest integer without going over, so again, that's going to be 0. x equals 0.5. Let's see. Then the greatest integer without going over, again, that's going to be 0. 0.75, again, without going over, that's 0. 1, now my greatest integer becomes 1. 1 1.25, the greatest integer without going over 1.25 is 1. 1 1.5, again, it's 1. All right, now let's go back to the negative numbers. So let's see. Negative 2, well, negative 2 is an integer, so the greatest integer that doesn't go over negative 2 is just negative 2. Negative 1.75, okay, now we get into that whole negative number thing. For negative 1.75, negative 1 is actually larger than negative 1.75. So negative 2 is the integer closest to this one without going over. Same thing for negative 1.5. Same thing for negative 1.25. Now at negative 1, the greatest integer without going over negative 1 is just negative 1. Let's see, for negative 0.75, the greatest integer without going over, so it's not going to be 0 because 0 is greater than negative 0.75, so it's going to also be negative 1. This is also going to be negative 1, and this one's also going to be negative 1. All right, so now I've got some points here that I can plot on my set of axes, and I can get a sense of what my graph is going to look like. So let's see, x equals negative 2 and negative 2, so... Here's a point, negative 1.75, and that's about right here, negative 1.75, negative 2, so that point's about right there, negative 1.5, negative 2, about right there, negative 1.25, negative 2, about right there, negative 1, negative 1, all right, and here I can see all of a sudden my points First, they were kind of along this line here, and then it jumps up here. Negative 1, negative 1. Negative 0.75, negative 1. Negative 0.5, negative 1. Negative 0.25, negative 1. And again, I get to 0, my next integer, and it kind of jumps up to this point right here. Let's see, 0 0.25, 0. 0.5, 0. 0 0.750, and I get to x equals 1, and all of a sudden y becomes 1. 1.251 1 and 1.51. 1. So you can start to get a sense of what this graph is going to look like. It's going to look like a bunch of straight lines that are kind of chopped up. And every time we go to a new integer, we just jump up to the next integer, so there's all these gaps here in between those lines. Now you can kind of see where it got the nickname the step function because it does in fact look like a series of steps. Now one more thing to note about the graph is we need to draw some dots, actually some dots and circles on our graph. And in particular, I'm going to make these larger maybe than I normally would just so you can see them. I'm going to have a dot right here and I'm going to have an open circle right here. A dot on the end of this line and an open circle at the end of this line. I'm going to have a dot on this line and an open circle here. A dot here and an open circle here. A dot here and an open circle here. A dot here and an open circle here. So 
all the dot means is the dot is just a point that's on the graph and an open circle means that that point right there so for example in this case the point negative one negative two this point is not on the graph and the reason we put these these dots and open circles on there is just to make it clear in our graph that the step function is in fact a function that is it will pass the vertical line test anywhere on the graph including for example at these breakpoints right here because if I draw a vertical line for example on x equals negative one I can see that this is only going to touch my graph in one place it's going to touch the graph where y is equal to negative one and that's because when x is equal to negative one y is equal to negative one it's not equal to negative two so this big dot right here indicates this is where the graph is and this open dot right here just indicates the graph is not there's there's no point on the graph where that open circle is but there are points on the graph all the way leading up to that open circle. Okay, let's talk some about transformations to the greatest integer function. Now, if we were going to take our greatest integer function and put it into what we've been calling graphing form, it would look like this. A times B times X plus C plus D. And we've seen this form before. This should look very familiar to you because all of our other functions that we've been looking at, we've used graphing form, and they all have the same basic form. Well, for the step function, some people use this and they talk about, you know, changing the, you know, center point or the vertex, you know, using C and D, or it becomes narrower depending on what A is or it flips. I don't typically use the graphing form when I'm doing graphs of transformations to the uh, greatest integer function just because I don't find it as helpful. What I do instead is I basically fill in enough numbers here on my XY table so that I can get a sense of what the pattern is going to look like and then I just fill in the rest on my graph. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like. Example number one. It says to graph this transformation of the step function two times the greatest integer X minus three plus one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these x values here. And notice I've got uh, some negative numbers and some positive numbers. And I also have some fractional numbers. I wanted to make sure to pick you know, not just integer values. So let me take each one of these numbers, plug it in for x, and then see what my corresponding y value is. And I'll fill it in the table. So if I take x equals negative 2, all right, so that's going to look like this. If x equals negative 2. So let's see, y equals 2 times, let's see, this will be negative 2 minus 3 plus 1, which means I'll have 2 times, that's going to be the greatest integer of negative 5 plus 1. The greatest integer of negative 5 is just negative 5. So that's 2 times negative 5 plus 1. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. And negative 10 plus 1 equals negative 9. So that's my corresponding y value. Let's do the same thing with this x value. x equals negative 1.5. So I've got y equals 2 times negative 1.5 minus 3, close brackets, plus 1. So let's see. Inside my brackets, negative 1.5 minus 3, that's going to give me the greatest integer of negative 4.5 plus 1. Now, the greatest integer of negative 4.5, remember that's a negative number, so these are kind of, kind of uh, odd. So negative 4.5, negative 4 is greater than negative 4.5. So my greatest integer is actually going to be negative 5. So that's going to be 2 times negative 5 plus 1. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10, and negative 10 plus 1 is negative 9. And again, I'm going to do this for each one of the rest of these numbers. Now, after you start to do a few, and depending on you know, how good your mental arithmetic is, you might be able to do these in your head. So, for example, if I was going to do this one in my head, for x equals negative 1, I would say, okay, negative 1 minus 3, that's negative 4 the greatest integer of negative 4 is just negative 4. 
2 times negative 4 is negative 8, and negative 8 plus 1 is negative 7. Now this one might be a little trickier because it involves a fraction. So let's see, negative 0.5. So let's see, negative 0.5 minus 3, that's going to be negative 3.5. The greatest integer of negative 3.5, it's not negative 3 because that's too big, it's negative 4. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 1 is negative 7. And I'm going to keep doing that for the rest of these numbers. So after you do this for the rest of these numbers, and I encourage you to pause the video here and go ahead and come up with those numbers, do the arithmetic on those numbers, and I already know what these are, what these are because I've already done them. So let's see. 0, that's going to be negative 5. This is also going to be negative 5. This one is going to be negative 3 and negative 3. And now I've got these points, I've got these x-y coordinate pairs, I can plot those over here on my set of axes. So let's see what that looks like. Negative 2, negative 9. Negative 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's right here. Negative 1.5 and negative 9. Negative 1, negative 7. Right there. Negative 0.5, negative 7. Let's see. 0, negative 5. 0.5, negative 5. 0.5, negative 5. 1, negative 3. 1.5, negative 3, and now I'm starting to see what the pattern looks like. I already know what the basic step function looks like. I already know what the parent function looks like. So this one I can see is going to look something like this. These are going to be my steps. And now again, I want to make sure I put in my closed in dots and also my open circles. And they always go in the same places here. And I can keep going since I see now what the pattern is. I'm going up by 2 every time I make a new step. So let's see. This next one would be, I go up 2. My next one would be right here. Go up 2. My next one would be right here. And so on. And there's a graph of my step form, step function with its transformations. Now you've got two more examples down there in your notes. I want you to try those on your own and see what the graphs of those transformed step functions look like.